pimples. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I thought, here we are, new place, new building, new cities. <laughs> is that a shock for anybody? Glory to God. The title of this new series is Keep It Simple. Keep It Simple. Glory to God. So I can tell you're all excited. Like, because it, why are you excited? Because it's time for the preaching. Yes. Whoa. Unless, of course, this is not the most eagerly anticipated part of a church service for you. <laughs> so maybe you're wondering how you should occupy your time for the duration of the preacher's slot. Maybe you're thinking, maybe I should just, maybe just switch off and daydream. Or maybe I will try and concentrate until my five-minute attention span quits on me. Or maybe I'll take the opportunity to catch up on social media. I mean, praise the Lord for free Wi-Fi and all that, eh? <laughs> Unless you haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> Or maybe, maybe I will give the preacher, preacher my full attention. Maybe, I, and hopefully I might learn something. In fact, hopefully I might learn something that will actually help me succeed and prosper mm. in this life that God has blessed me with. Yeah. You know, I, I believe this morning the major, the major deciding factor in regards to all of these different choices will actually be based, I believe, on how much value you place on what will be said over the next, and we won't try and put a time limit on it. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the value that you place upon the message will actually determine the level of attention that you give to it. And that in turn will determine the level of understanding that you receive from it. So the value you place on it will determine the, the level of attention that you give it and the level of attention that you give it will determine the level of understanding that you receive from it. And I want to tell you, I'm going to be quite frank with you right now at the very outset, this will be a simple message. Say it simple. simple. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. You know, it's always puzzled me over the years why so many people seem to struggle with such a simple message. And I realized a number of years ago that people struggle so much because the simple message that we preach has been stripped of all of the layers of mystery. It's like it's been demystified and all of the tradition that has been added in over the centuries to this simple gospel message has been stripped away. All of that tradition that added clauses and conditions and complexities that allowed for what God said must happen when you simply believe to no longer happen. <laughs> or that basically taught that any good stuff that you could possibly be expected to come from God was only reserved for those who consistently gave their best performance. And sometimes when you strip away all of that stuff, it's almost like people choke on the simplicity of the message. Jesus said something, he said, only believe. It's that simple. <laughs> say it simple. simple. Turn that person next and say, keep it simple. <laughs> it's almost like people don't seem to recognize the stripped back original version. I've said many times over the years, it's, it's, it's like the gospel is so simple, you need help to misunderstand it. <laughs> it's so simple that people who like to complicate things can tragically miss out on what is always good news. It's always good news. Say it simple. simple. Keep it simple. Remind yourself, keep it simple. Our message is a simple message because Jesus' message was a simple message. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 34 to 35, it says, Jesus always used stories and illustrations like these when speaking to the crowds. In fact, he never spoke to them without using such parables. This fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet. I will speak to you in parables. Now I know every one of you are so spiritual that you fully understood that video that we just showed and what it represented from scripture. <laughs> okay. <laughs> this fulfilled what God had spoken through the prophet. I will speak to you in parables. I will explain things hidden since the creation of the world. And the message translation puts it this way. All Jesus did that day was tell stories. A long storytelling afternoon. His storytelling fulfilled the prophecy. Someone says, I hope this isn't going to fulfill any prophecy here. <laughs> I'm not really looking forward to a long storytelling afternoon. But anyhow, you're here now. May as well hang in for the duration. His storytelling fulfilled the prophecy. I will open my mouth and tell stories. 
I will bring out into the open things hidden since the world's first day. Wow. I guess that means that parables must be really deep theology. I guess it means they must be packaged in loads of five and six syllable words that you can barely pronounce. Everybody here pronounces it, pronounces it different. <laughs> well, listen to the definition of a parable. A parable is a simple story used to illustrate a moral or spiritual lesson as told by Jesus in the Gospels. You used to say that you know you're called to preach when everything that you see becomes an illustration. <laughs> everything you see or experience in life becomes a parable that you, keep, that you store up. <laughs> see, it's simple. Come on, keep it simple. simple. Mark chapter 4, verse 1. Once again Jesus began teaching by the lakeshore. A very large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into a boat. Then he sat in the boat while all the people remained on the shore. And he taught them by telling many stories in the form of parables, such as this one. Listen, a farmer went out to plant some seed. And as he scattered it across his field, some of the seed fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate it. Other seed fell on shallow soil with underlying rock. The seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plant soon wilted under the hot sun since it didn't have deep roots and it died. Other seed fell among thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plant so that they produced no grain. Still other seeds fell in fertile soil and they sprouted, grew and produced a crop that was 30, 60 and even 100 times as much as had been planted. Then he said, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. I want to encourage this morning. Check your ears. Are they still there? Still attached? Anybody here without ears this morning? Well, if not, this is for you. Listen to what he says next. Later, when Jesus was alone with the twelve disciples and with the others who were gathered around, they asked him what the parables meant. He replied, you are permitted to understand the secret of the kingdom of God. But I use parables for everything I say to outsiders, so that the scriptures might be fulfilled. When they see that what I do, they will learn nothing. When they hear what I say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. Now, who knows, some people have used these words of Jesus to exclude some folks and remove their right to choose. If I was to get a hold of something this morning, that could not be further from the truth. Right. If you read that through, depending on what tradition you were raised in, you can read that or you can hear that through certain traditional filters that will support a certain theo theological viewpoint or doctrinal viewpoint that is actually very wrong. Mm -hmm. And we'll hopefully we'll see that a bit clearer as we move on. <coughs> It all comes down to the, 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 the fundamental and foundational message of the gospel, you see. If you want to understand this, you need to hear what Jesus said to Nicodemus. You must be born again. <laughs> you must be born again. You must be born from above. From above. What Jesus said, he said, my words, the words I speak, they are spirit and they are life. His words are spirit words. Words that speak to the new life. Not to the old life, to the new life that begins when you are born again into the kingdom and the family of God. And you get to choose. He said, this is for whoever believes. Amen. This is for the whosoever. You get to choose either to receive or to reject that opportunity for a new life. Let's back up a little bit. Let's read that again. When they hear what I say, they will not understand. Otherwise, they will turn to me and be forgiven. Well, if you read that, not through certain traditional filters, but read it, I believe the way Jesus intended it to be heard, was that, well, if you do hear, you will hear what I say, and you will understand, and you will turn to me and be forgiven. Because <laughs> that's his heart. How do I know that? Because I've read the whole Bible. Because <laughs> I've read every scripture. I've read the whole word of God and it says that God's not willing that any should perish, that any should miss their purpose, that any should miss out on this opportunity. I think I've got one person smiling back at me right now. <laughs> That's a start. <laughs> I refuse to be discouraged. <laughs> I 
He's the saviour of all men. Especially, I'm just giving you scripture. He's the saviour of all men, especially of those who believe. Those who hear, understand, and turn to him, and whose sins are forgiven, and who are born again, and whose spirit is quickened and made alive, and all of a sudden the words begin to make sense. Because his words are spirit words. Your soul cannot make sense of these words. Your, your intellect cannot make sense. Your natural intellect cannot make sense of his words. Even in all of their simplicity, you miss, you, you're going to misunderstand them. You're going to misrepresent them to others. You must be born again. Because Jesus' words are spirit words. They're words that speak to the new life. And you get to choose either to receive or to reject this opportunity for a new life. You get a, you get a, you get a choice to either turn to him and have your sins and all the mess-ups of your old life forgiven or you can hold on to all that mess. But you choose. You get to, you get to choose. He says, I, I present to you, I, 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 I place before you death and life, blessing or curse. You choose. You choose. Who said that? God said that. Did he change his mind at some point? No, he never changed his mind. When he said something, he said it. <laughs> you choose. You get to choose. Who knows when Paul was preaching at Athens, he told them that, that God is actually commanding all men, all sinners everywhere to come home. Mm-hmm. He's commanding them, come on home. The door's been flung open, why are you outside? Jesus said these words, I use parables to the outsiders. He said, come on, nobody's supposed to be outside, come on in. So they'll understand his words and the, and, the, and the awesome life that he has for them, the plans that he has for them, they're always for good and never for evil. evil. But you get to choose. Right. You can stick with your own plans, but you can align yourself with his plans. You can choose. And if you're here this morning, if you just came here today to spend a religious hour, maybe you came to scratch some kind of religious itch that you have, or, or maybe you just came to hopefully mark your card for heaven and when you die, so that when you, when you get to the pearly gates, you can bring out your card and say, well, I was at the retirement centre on the 6th of May, 2018. Does that count for anything? <laughs> Sorry, no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully mark your card that, 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 that when you die, possibly, you know, that <laughs> if, if, that's, if, that's, if that's where you're at this morning, then, then you possibly only heard that parable that Jesus gave at a natural level. And for you, it was basically nothing more than, than entry-level principles for good farming. Um. <laughs> At least you said you left with something, <laughs> if you were listening. But if you came here today looking to scratch a little, a deeper itch, to go a little deeper, to get, you know, who knows when an itch is deep, it's hard to get at. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm talking about. You know, sometimes there's an itch, it's just, you can scratch it and it just doesn't work. And you realize that itch is even deeper than the surface. I've got to get in a bit deeper and scratch that thing. And every one of us has an itch like that on the inside. <laughs> and if you came here this morning looking to scratch a little deeper, to scratch that deeper itch, if you came here to look, if you came here looking to, to, to meet with Jesus because you recognize that He actually has supernatural answers to your questions, yeah. that He actually has supernatural solutions to your problems, then you will hear His. Very simple story, quite differently. Verse 13, it says, Then Jesus said to them, If you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? Who knows that some people see what God is doing, but they don't recognize, or they don't, or they don't perceive, or, they, or, or they're not aware or conscious of the fact that it's actually God that's doing it. Mm-hmm. I've even heard Christians say things like, well, nothing happening. It's nothing happening. When all around them, God is working. He's blessing people. He's healing people. He's setting people free. But it's like they're not seeing it. They hear, but they don't understand that God is speaking. And they don't understand that what he is saying is a life source to them. They don't understand the life that is in the seed of God's word. They don't understand the abundant harvest that that seed can produce in their lives. You know, there's a lot of folks who claim they want to experience the power of God's word. You hear this morning saying, I want to experience the power of God's word. Maybe some some folks will even challenge him to demonstrate the power of his word. If you would just do this, then I would believe in you. 
You know what Jesus said? It's a wicked and perverted and adulterous generation who challenged God in that way. He doesn't want us to base our faith on the demonstration of the power of his word. He wants us to understand the word of his power. And there is a fundamental difference. And if that's you, then you... If you're one of these people that, that, that demands from God a demonstration of the power of his word, then you, you see the results of God's word and what the word, God do, do, word of God does all around you, but you don't understand. You don't perceive. You don't, you're not aware or conscious of the fact that it's actually the word of God that's done it. Mm-hmm. Someone gets born again. You know what people say? I've heard it. They said it to me. People said to me, oh, well, yeah, don't but you needed it. And they were right. But they needed it too. <laughs> well, they weren't wrong. They were absolutely right. The problem was that they needed it too. Some of this born again people say, well, that's good. They've, they've got their life together because they really needed something. Ah. <laughs> someone, someone testifies to being supernaturally healed and people immediately rationalize it and just put it down to a lucky break. Yeah. Or the effectiveness of the medical treatment. Thank God for the medical treatment. But the person just testified that God healed them. Right. <laughs> Come on somebody. Yeah. They hear what the word of God says. But they don't understand how the kingdom of God works. And that the word of God is the word of his power. And it will do what it says. Yes. Say it's simple. Remind that person next to you. Keep it simple. <laughs> let's, listen to how it works. In Luke chapter 5, verses 12 to 15. In one of the villages, Jesus met a man with an advanced case of leprosy. And when the man saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground, begging to be healed. Lord, he said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him and said, hang on, I'm not sure about this. I'll have to figure out whether that you're one of the ones I do or one of the ones I don't. I'll have to figure out whether um, it is actually my will to heal you or not. Just give me a moment on this, will you? In fact, give me five. I had to go and consult my father on this. No, he said something else. He said, I am willing. This is I am talking. No, I was or I will be. This is I am talking. I am never changes. I am willing, he said. Be healed. He didn't say do something in order to get healed. He just said be healed. He was You're trying to help this guy understand something that, that you're standing in the presence of the healer, that means that you get this close to healing, you're already healed. Yeah. When you get born again and I got born again, we got born again healed. That's right. Yeah. By an uncorruptible seed. If you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him. I am willing. He said, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. Then Jesus instructed him not to tell anyone what had happened. He said, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed. That reminds me of something. Hang on. <laughs> <laughs> Oops, a daisy. There we go. That's that sorted. <laughs> Take along the offering required, but no offerings are required anymore, isn't that awesome? That's true, yeah. The one offering's been made. Yeah. Hallelujah. Take along the offering required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. But despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even faster, and vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. Jesus, Jesus demonstrated there that the word works. Say the word works. He demonstrated there that it's always God's will for his word to bring healing to the sick or to the broken or to the outcast. In Hebrews chapter 1 verses 1 to 4 it says, God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the world's who be the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all... Th- I mean, this is, this, is, this is... He's writing this letter to the Hebrews, you understand. <laughs> and upholding all things by the word of his power, 
when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name. In Revelation 19.13 it says that Jesus is called the Word of God. The Word of God. You know, in John 16, verse 23, Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, whatever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. Whatever you ask the Father in my name, that's in my name. What's his name? The Word of God. Whatever you ask the Father that's in the Word of God that he has promised in his Word, he will give you. Say it simple. simple. Keep it simple. Ask according to the word. Ask for whatever the word promises. Sow the seed of God's word and you can expect a harvest. Mm -hmm. Now we've been looking over the last few weeks, haven't we, at Jesus' mission statement contained there in Luke 4, 18 and 19. But we can read that and and we don't always understand. We kind of scratch our heads sometimes wondering how how can we possibly bring healing and deliverance and and how can we introduce people to God's favour and we wonder if maybe we just run around slapping hands on people and just hope for the best. Or maybe we should organize a meeting like this and try and create a kind of spooky atmosphere and maybe we'll get lucky. Well, it's a lot simpler than that. Say it's simple. simple. Keep it simple. Listen up. Let's continue there in Mark chapter 4, verse 13. Then Jesus said to them, If you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all the other parables? The message it says, he continued, do you see how this story works? All my stories work this way. (laughs) He said, this is the parable that explains all parables. This is a parable that reveals how the kingdom works. Every time, not some of the time, (laughs) not occasionally, not when you get lucky, no, every time. Every time. Who knows, there are, there are sincere believers, I know many of them personally, who think that there are certain things that Jesus did that you can no longer expect him to do. They don't understand this parable. Yeah. Because Jesus, well, because God said and, and, and recorded there in the book of the beginnings that as long as this world exists, there will be seed time and harvest. And so the principles contained in this parable, in this story that Jesus told, the principles contained here will always work. Will always work. If you apply them. (laughs) If you choose to apply them. Mm -hmm. Mark 4, verse 14 to 20. The sower sows the word. I think it's the New Living Translation says the farmer plants seeds by taking God's word to others. How simple is that? Say it's simple. simple. Keep it simple. Come on. <laughs> we need to understand that every seed, I'm talking here in the natural, every seed knows what to do when it is sown. Yeah. Come on. Some of you folks in here, you, you, you're gardeners, you know this. You apply this principle over and over and over again. Is it, it doesn't fail you. <laughs> If the seed fails to produce, it's because you did something wrong with it. It wasn't the seed that failed, it's because you failed. Because the seed knew exactly what it was to do as soon as you did with the seed what you were supposed to do with that seed. Simple. Every seed is programmed to reproduce after its kind. Every seed is programmed to produce a harvest. But until the seed is sown, who knows a seed can remain dormant for a long, long time. Yeah. Just looks like a dead thing. You could buy a packet of seeds and the picture on the front looks beautiful and you open it up and there's these horrible little <laughs> things inside. These boring looking little things. Maybe you decided this morning on oh, no, us to preach this is the boring bit. Well, don't be looking for your harvest anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> but then you'll blame the preacher or you'll blame God or you'll blame something come on mm-hmm. no if you do with the seed what you're supposed to do with the seed the seed will the seed it knows exactly what to do itself and the seed will do what it will do 
Say it simple. Come on, keep it simple, folks. We can strip away all of that other gunk that has, come on, obliterated the truth for years, held people back from experiencing everything that God has for them. And all of a sudden, it's so simple. If you say you understand this, you'll understand everything about how the kingdom works. You'll never fail to receive again from what is provided for you already in, in, in my kingdom. We were saying it, come on, earlier on. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Verse 15, Mark chapter 4. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message only to have Satan come at once and take it away. So the footpath folks, they hear the message, but they have a hard or an unreceptive or an unbelieving heart and so the seed cannot penetrate and cannot do what it is programmed to do. And so because it remains on the surface, it has no protection and it can be easily stolen away. And I can understand how folks get that way. Because a lot of people have had a lot of negative experiences. A lot of people have had a lot of negative circumstances in their life. It feels like these circumstances, these experiences have trampled them, trampled all over them. And it's like they've become hard as a result of that. And it's very hard for them to hear a word that tells them that God has everything under control. That God wants you to have everything that he's made available to you all of the time. And so a word like this can just bounce off the hardness. And be lost to you. And that's a tragedy. You see, we can turn over the ground if we just take a bit of time to dig a little. Even the hard ground can be turned over again. Yeah. Even the hard ground can be turned into good soil again. Come on, someone. Yeah. Is that right, Ali? Yeah. Is that right, yeah? Yeah. Janet? All the gardeners? <laughs> Man, come on. How many gardeners are there in here? Man, come on. You know that stuff? I know Lorraine shaking her head. <laughs> Confession is good for the soul. Hallelujah. So they say. If you just dig a little out, do you place sufficient value in what has been said here today to give it your attention? Because this word's coming to plow up, maybe even some of that hard ground. Some of that stuff that has become hard just through circumstance and through experience, and, and nobody can deny that there's some pretty horrible experiences that life can chuck at you. But even the hardest ground can become productive again. That's why we never, break. God told us to put this in our, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our statement of faith. Way back at the beginning, at the beginning of this church, he said, put this in there, place it in there. We will never bring the word of God down to the level of our experience. Yeah. But we will always believe God to bring our experience up to the level of what his word promises. Do you place sufficient value in what has been said here today to give it your full attention, to guard against any distractions that would allow this word to be stolen from you? In well, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, it says, Keep and guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Another translation says, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Why? Because your heart is the ground in which the seed of God's word is so protect that ground with all diligence guard it above all else because it determines the course of your life the seeds that you sow will determine the harvest that you produce yeah. that is produced what you, who knows what you value the most is what you're most diligent to protect and guard Someone who doesn't really care whether someone steals his bike or not doesn't bother to chain it to a lamppost. <laughs> Come on. Someone who doesn't care about the value of money or, or anything else just takes all his savings and puts them out side on the doorstep. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> What you value the most is what you are most diligent to protect and guard. 
or do you place such little value upon what has been said today that you are ready to allow it to be immediately snatched from you? Which will result in one thing. It will result in you losing all of the benefits associated with this seed, with this word, with this message. In verse 16 it goes on that says, The seed on the rocky soil represents those who hear the message and immediately receive it with joy. Hallelujah! But since they don't have deep roots, they don't last long. They fall away as soon as they have problems or are persecuted for believing God's word. Maybe you're one of the rocky soil people. (laughs) You get excited, you shout amen when you hear the good news about healing and provision and and favour and righteousness and all of the good stuff. And the seed begins to do what it's programmed to do in your life. You begin to tell other people about what's happening and what God's doing in your life. But as soon as you experience any opposition to what the seed of the word is producing, then you give up on it, you quit on it. It's like you're easily argued out of your faith. I'll tell you one of the things, I was just meditating on this this morning earlier on. In fact, I woke up with this in my heart this morning. One of the things that you will hear as soon as you begin to testify about what the seed of God's word is producing in your life, one of the things you will hear that will shut you down if you let it is, who do you think you are? That's when you need to know who you are. (laughs) You need to know that that your roots go down deep. That you're established on the rock. Hallelujah. His name is Jesus. Hallelujah. That everything that you have is a result of what he provided and what he did on your behalf. Come on, son boy. It's not just what you're experiencing that's been stolen from you. It's what he's did on your behalf. That's, and the testimony that should be attached to that that has just been stolen. The devil... He's after you, but he's really after something way bigger than you. <laughs> I mean, you, you, you're, you're kind of in the way, and you're kind of a little bit of the evidence, but you know, it's really the... <laughs> it's God he's after. It's his throne he's after. Come on, somebody. Mm-hmm. Anything he can do, you rubbish his name. That's what he really wants. That's right. Who do you think you are? You ever heard that one? You start to testify about what God has been doing, what God has done, what God has provided. Who do you think you are? You need to know who you are at that point. Or maybe even a, maybe it's a shift in circumstances that has uprooted you or, 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 or has, and begins to frazzle your commitment to hold on to the fruit of the word. Things begin to look a bit negative and begin to appear as if, well, maybe it's not actually working and you just let go of it. And at the end of that, you conclude, well, obviously this faith stuff doesn't work after all. They're just going back to the other stuff. May as well just go back to the unbelieving stuff. Verse 18, the seed that fell among the thorns represents others who hear God's word. But all too quickly the message is crowded out by the worries of this life, the lure of wealth, the desire for other things so that no fruit is produced. Maybe you're like one of the thorns folks. (laughs) <laughs> the thorns people maybe you have an understanding of the word and, and how it works you begin to get a hold of that you've experienced its power in your life you've experienced the word of God's power producing in your life but somehow the stresses the anxieties of life or the world and all of its glitter they, 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 they divert your attention you become more focused on the world than on the word You know, some people don't have to wait to get to hell before they start experiencing it. Mm-hmm. You, know how you, get the, you know how you get the hell out of the world? Get to the world. That's the hell out of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's simple. Keep it simple. You want to get the hell out of this world, this life? It's like hell. Well, get back to the world, you get the hell out of it. Someone says, where are you going? I'm getting the hell out of here. <laughs> I've been distracted. Spend all my life on Facebook instead of Facebook. Come on, somebody, help me. <laughs> been diverted. You see, the kingdom op- operates opposite to the world because in the kingdom, the way up is down. The way to live is to die. 
The way to get is to give. Is that contrary or is that contrary? There's many voices competing for your attention. We live in an atmosphere that is in media saturation. It's an information overload. And that's why we need to do what Jesus did when Satan offered him at all. He took him up and he said, there it is, the whole world, I'll give it, I'll give it all to you. What did Jesus say? He got the hell out of there. <laughs> took the hell out of the world and got back to the word. He said, it is written. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. You need to make a decision. We need to make a decision. I'm not getting diverted from what God has said by voices that tell me I need to do something else yeah. other than simply trust God to fulfill his word. Yeah. I'm just going to continue in this, in this place of worship, mm -hmm. in this posture of worship. I'm going to continue here. I'm going to continue to worship the Lord my God, my Father in heaven, who has promised to be everything that I will ever need him to be. Come on now, the first two priorities of a father are to protect and provide. Yeah, yeah. How much more, Jesus said, if you being evil know how to do these things for your children, how much more? Come on, folks, we've been limited in our experience of the how much more. We've been hindered in our experience. We, 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 we bought into how much less. Religion sold us a lie of how much less. Well, I know what God, I, I, feel, I know God's word says that, but you can't really expect that. What did they just say? How much less? How, no, no, Jesus said how much more. I ain't listening to you. I'm getting back into, my, into worship. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting back before I am. I ain't, I ain't going to believe your lies of I was or I will be. No, no, I'm getting back before I am. Yeah. And I ain't moving until what he said comes to pass. Yeah. And I'm still not moving because I'll be there to thank him. <laughs> So I'm not just looking for a little temporary repair. Hallelujah. I'm not looking for temporary respite. I'm looking for the fulfillment of the reality of what he has promised. Not just for time, but for eternity. Come on, yeah. some boy. If this is eternal life, I need to know it's starting down here. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to get there and find out no, I'm, not, I'm, I'm out, not in. Best way to know that is to be eternal life begins the moment you're born again. You start to experience. Come on. It's a quality of life, not just a quantity. In fact, you can't quantify it. So get rid of quantity altogether. It's a quality. I'll tell you what, you pick quality street, glory to God, you'll be having celebrations for the rest of your life. <laughs> you'll never have to choose again. You can have them both. Amen. Personally, I prefer my heroes. Anyhow, I've only got one hero. His name is Jesus. Come on. <laughs> I mean, one of, the, one of the things that blesses me so much is knowing that Mr. Cadbury was a believer. That he is in heaven producing chocolate from, from the milk of heaven. <laughs> what is that going to be like? I mean, it's pretty heavenly down here. But whoa. Come on, someone. And no weight gain. Yeah. <laughs> as much chocolate. Mm. Wow. Cadbury's chocolate. Wow. Verse 20. Nearly done. The seed that fell on good soil represents those who hear and accept God's word and produce a harvest of 30, 60, or even 100 times as much as had been planted. What did God say? As long as this world exists, as long as this world continues, there will be seed time and harvest. Come on, do you hear? Do you hear? When, when, when you hear the word of God, do you really hear what it says? Do you accept that word as your final word? Do you accept God's word, the word of his power, as your final authority? Do you, do, you, do you believe here today that the seed that is sown in good ground will always produce a harvest? Do you believe that this is how the kingdom works? Do you believe what Jesus said when you understand this parable, this story, you'll understand all other parables, you'll understand all of the other stories that I tell, all of the other things that I say because this is how the kingdom works. 
Come on. We, he, the disciples said, teach us to pray, Jesus. He said, this is how you pray. Our Father <laughs> in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Then he said, give us today, this day, our daily bread. Know that God gives seed to the sower so that there might be bread for the eater. When you say your will be done, you're saying I receive the seed of your word because the seed of his word contains the fulfillment of his will. It's not. <laughs> Come on. No, when you're saying your will be done, you're saying, I receive the seed of your word because your seed contains your, your word contains your will. I don't know what God's will is. Well, you don't know what his word says then. Because his word is, his will is very clear in his word. Give us today our daily bread. The bread we eat today will be the fruit of the seed that we sowed another day. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on, somebody. Right. It's simple. Keep it simple. Jesus said this is how it works. The bread that we eat today will be the seed that we sowed another day. Yeah. I remember I'd go out to the buyer. And my granny says, I'd say, what's that? A bag of horrible looking things. That's seed potatoes, son. <laughs> what are they? They're the reason that you've been eating the potatoes you were eating with your herring today, son. <laughs> if they hadn't kept the seed, there would be no potatoes next year. Well, they could cry and pray and greet and shout and sling snow as much as they like, but Come on, somebody. Well, we forgot to go to the shop. Do you think we should go out and just get the seed potatoes? Oh, no, no, no. They're very precious. <laughs> you never eat your seed. That's right. <laughs> you never eat your seed. You sow your seed. Mm -hmm. I've seen it for years. People coming down to all their calls. You know what they wanted? They wanted to eat their seed. Well, they wanted, it, they wanted to eat on somebody else's harvest. Uh -huh. They come forward and say, what would you like? And you, you give them a word and they go, I don't want a word. I want you to slap hands with me. I want you to fall down and feel that <laughs> something's happened. <laughs> I can guarantee if that's your attitude, nothing will change but your clothes got a bit dirty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm, I'm in. I'm in. I, I, I said before, I, I can do carpet time along with everybody else. Like I said, sometimes it's the only way to get arrested in church. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes something real, you know something real has happened. You just know it. You know it, then you know it. But God's always got a word. Yeah. If you've got a question, his answer is always in his word. Yeah. If you've got a problem, his solution is always in his word. Right. He sends it to you in seed form. He says, what will you do with this seed? Because this seed knows what to do. If you will do with the seed what you're supposed to do with it. Just receive it into your heart. Protect it. Guard it. Stay excited about it. Yeah. <laughs> Water it. How do you want it? Jesus loves me. This I know. Keep it simple. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Oh, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. How do you know that? The Bible tells me so. That's how you know. That's how you know that the seed of his word will produce. Because Jesus loves you. Because Jesus loves me. How do you, what, what, what do you mean you're believing for your healing? How can you, how can you say that? Because I know. How can you know? Because... Jesus loves me. How do you know that? Because the Bible tells me so.
St. Corinthians 9.10, it says, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed that you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. That seed that we guarded and protected, that seed that we guarded and protected as we pushed through all of the opportunities to be diverted, that seed that we guarded and protected until it began to produce a bountiful harvest, some 30, some 60, sometimes a hundredfold. Paul prayed that for the church, then he? said, I want you to know this love. Yes, Jesus loves me. Because when you get a handle on this love, it protects, it wraps a layer of protection. It, it draws that seed into your heart and it surrounds it with the love that Romans 5 says is poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Yes. The revelation of his love draws and causes that seed to begin to break loose and begin to produce in our lives. Do you know what? A lot of people don't have a faith problem. They have a love problem. They don't believe that God loves them. Somewhere in there, there's a worm. And that's the one thing that will stop this from working. You need to surround this word with that revelation. He loves me. Because he loves me, of course he's going to save me. Of course he wants to heal me. Of course he wants to deliver me. Of course he wants to set me free. Of course he wants to protect me. Of course he wants to provide me. Why? Because he loves me. I bet you know, I know what you were like before. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the good news. Yeah. When I was doing the very worst thing I ever did, while I was still a sinner, while I was still running around doing my own thing, that's when he chose to demonstrate how much he loved me. Yeah. Jesus loves me, this I know. What do you need this morning? I want you to hear, there's a, there's a, there's a word that God has for you. Maybe, you. maybe you're not even born again. Well, this morning, he wants you to get born again. He wants you to receive the seed of his love into your heart. That he loved you so much that he went on the cross and he died there for you. And he took your sin and your sickness and your mess and all of your troubles and strife and everything else. And he took them and he removed them far from you so that you could enter into a brand new life. That's lived a brand new way in the revelation of just how much he loves you. And when into that into that good ground of, of, of a heart filled with a revelation of his love, you bring the seed of his word and the word knows what to do when it gets there. It begins to break loose and produce everything that God has promised. Come on! Simple. Keep it simple. Keep it. Yes, Jesus loves me. Come on! Say the word works. Say it simple. simple. Turn that person next. You say, keep it simple. simple. Hallelujah. I think I'm going to close there. I want to tell you there's a harvest here today. If you'll take this word and just throw it into this heart that's saying yes to Jesus, you can bring a seed into your into your life will begin to produce for you over and over again. Oh, hallelujah. You know that every time that you believe God, I'm just, this is just flowing to me right now, I'll just finish with this. Every time that you believe God, every time you take the seed of his word and sow it in your life, and it begins to produce what it knows how to produce, supernaturally, and you, know, you, you know what your seed is from that? Testimony. Yes. Testimony. You begin to tell other people. And you know what that testimony does? It's, it plants a seed out there. And those who can receive the seed of your testimony. You know what it says in Revelation 12, 11? They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Do you want to turn this whole thing around? Do you want to start to see this? This kingdom advance. This is how we do it. We receive the seed of his word. We let the word do what the word knows how to do. And we from that from that experience of what God has done through the word of his power, through the Holy Spirit confirming that word as we heard, read this morning already from Mark chapter 16 they went out and they preached everywhere the Lord confirming the word with the accompanying signs, come on, the Holy Spirit was with them right there with them, come on somebody you take this, that experience and you, and you take a testimony of that and you sow it as a seed into the life of into a work colleague, and someone in your own family, into your next door neighbour and that person that hates your guts, come on somebody <laughs> if they can just simply believe that God loves them, then that word will do what that word knows what to do. That seed will begin to open. Come on. Let's stand up together. Hallelujah. Blessed be your name. Come on. It's simple. Say it's simple. Say it's simple. Hallelujah. Keep it simple, folks. 
glory to God, we're going to go on over the next few weeks maybe and just look at some more of these parables. Now we know how it works. We're going to get some stuff. We're going to get some testimonies. We're going to be able to sow testimony into people's lives. We're going to be able to bring people in here and say, God has your number. He knows everything about you. He loves you. His heart is towards you. He wants to save you, to heal you, to deliver you. All of these things can happen. And it's simple. Yeah. It's simple. It's simple. It's simple. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you again for your incredible goodness. <laughs> oh, yes, Jesus loves me. Yeah. Yes, Jesus loves me. How do I know? Because the Bible tells me so. I choose to believe what the Bible says. And the Bible tells me that he loves me so much. He loved me so much that when I was at my very worst, doing the worst thing I ever did, the one thing I don't want you ever to find out about, <laughs> all you folks out there, all you nosy people, at that point, he demonstrated his love for me when he went on that cross. Amen. And he said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. But things are about to change. Oh, hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray your blessing upon your people here this morning. I thank you, Father, you have a, a plan and a purpose for each life that's exceedingly and abundantly far above all that we've ever begun to even ask, think, or imagine. Bring us into the fullness of that, Father. Lord, that we might be seed sowers, seed scatterers, testimonies, bum, 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 all over the, this town, all over this island, all over the nations. Testimonies going out like seed for your glory, for yours is the kingdom, <laughs> and yours is the power, and yours is the glory forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. Amen.